are a pastor. If that's what God has called you to do, that's what you are. There are no ifs, ands, or buts about it. You are a pastor. You must conduct yourself as such. You must carry yourself as such. You must walk out what God has asked you to do in that office. Well, hello everyone. Welcome to another great Pastoring Essentials. I'm so excited that you joined us for this month's edition. And uh, I believe that we're going to get into some things uh, this morning that are going to encourage you, that are going to edify you, that are going to build you up and help you become all that God wants you to be. Not just the pastor that God wants you to be, but the man or the woman of God that God desires to see you become. Let's pray and we'll get right in to today's lesson. Father, thank you for the opportunity that you've given us to share your word with the men and the women of God who are watching this broadcast. And Father, I pray that they would be empowered, that they would be strengthened, that they would be uh, motivated to do even more for you in your kingdom through what we're going to say today. And I pray in the name of Jesus that your anointing would flow today and that the power of the revelation of the Word of God would manifest in our lives. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, we have a very wonderful subject uh, this month that we're dealing with, and I want to talk today about the joy of pastoring. You know, this year we are celebrating 20 years of pastoring here in our Kansas location, and I look back over those years and you know very often people relate the challenges. I remember reading a book one time uh, that had to do with pastoring, that had to do with pastoring the local church. And uh, you know the, the, the premise of the book was uh, intended to help people, to help people that were in the position of pastoring, people whose family was in the position of pastoring and these different things. But as I read it, each chapter was so focused on the challenges, the, uh, the struggles, if you will, uh, the, the, the hard things that come up, the attitudes that people have, the, the problems that people will have with, with you, with your family, with your wife, with your children. As I look back over the 20 years that we've been doing this, 20 years of of full-time pastoring, there have been challenges. I mean, you're not going to ever get a group of people together for any length of time that you don't have challenges. But at the same time, the joy of pastoring far outweighs the challenges of pastoring. Uh, the, 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 the Word of God declares that Jesus, for the joy that was set before Him, endured the cross. It was, it was him focusing on the joy that caused him to get through the challenges. If you, as a man or a woman of God, if you're not focused on the joy of what you're doing, then when the challenges do come and they do present themselves, that challenge will take your strength. It will take your victory. It'll take uh, your spiritual stamina. And here's why. The Bible says the joy of the Lord is our strength. Proverbs also says that if your strength fail in the day of it, if, you're, if, you, if you fail or faint in the day of adversity, your strength is small. So very often I will hear pastors talk and they'll talk about pastoring and, and <clears throat> they tend to focus on the challenges. They tend to focus on the problems that they have faced. And, and even when they're... Uh, conducting meetings and, and they're conducting, uh, you know, pastoral panels and these different things when they're talking to Bible school students or people that have uh, potential pastoring in their future. They're always very quick to focus and to point out the challenges. Oh, and you're going to face this and you're going to face that and you've got to do this. Listen, the joy that comes from doing what God has asked you to do far outweighs any challenge that you may face as a pastor. So after 20 years of pastoring full-time, I've come to the conclusion 
that a very small percentage of what I have faced has been challenges and uh, issues, problems with people. That, uh, I, I, it has occurred, but the joy of seeing people saved and healed and marriages restored and lives turned around and people delivered and set free from the bondage of sin and uh, addiction and other things far outweighs, far outweighs anything uh, that you would consider a challenge or a hard time. So the joy of pastoring is what we want to look at. And I want to look at a couple of things today that are going to help you, I believe, uh, some points here that are going to help you maintain the joy of pastoring. And I just want to mention uh, real quickly, one of our resources that we have available here is a uh, a uh, book that I wrote some years ago now, uh, a couple, two or three years ago, on the local church, the hope of the world. And we deal in here with the, the beauty of the office of the pastor, uh, the dignity and the honor that the Word of God gives it. And so all you have to do is write us, P.O. Box 452, DeSoto, Kansas, request this book, and uh, they will uh, let you know uh, exactly how that you can receive it. I believe it's, it's $12.00 and uh, you can call and order it and we'll be glad to send it to you. Uh, it'll be a great resource for your personal library, great resource for your staff uh, uh, to hand out to them. It's a short book, doesn't take very long to read it, but it has a lot of vital information. Uh, so as we get into this, the joy of pastoring, the first point to realize, to maintain your joy in your pastoring is that it is Jesus' church. The church that you're pastoring belongs to Jesus. He founded the church. I know that, that you may have started the church in the natural, but ultimately the church, Jesus founded the church. He said in Matthew chapter 16 and verse 18, he said, upon this rock, I will build my church. One of the most significant things about the local church that we're the pastors of is that Jesus called it his church. He took personal responsibility and personal ownership over the church. So one of the keys of maintaining the joy in my pastoring is to recognize that it's Jesus' church. And you'll find that it's easy to be joyful as a pastor when you realize the church belongs to Jesus. It's easy to maintain my joy as a pastor when I realize the church belongs to Jesus. I am his under-shepherd. I am his co-pastor over the people. Because here, here's, here's the issue. If it belongs to Jesus and I'm doing my part, ultimately Jesus is responsible for the success of that church. Now, I have a part to play. I have an integral role as the pastor. I have to hear from him about his church. I have to put in the time commitment. I have to have the character, the diligence, the integrity, the commitment to do what God has asked me to do. But ultimately, it, the church belongs to Jesus. When, when you're having a problem, when you're facing a challenge, you need to go to Jesus and talk to him about the challenges that you're facing leading his church. The reason why Jesus personally came and walked through the seven churches in the book of Revelation, the seven churches of Asia Minor, the reason why he personally came and walk through those churches is those churches belong to him. They belong to him. He had a right to direct and to mandate what needed to happen in those churches. That's why he was there personally walking through those churches, literally personally walking through those churches because they belong to him. Jesus comes to your church. Jesus 
comes to the church that you pastor. I should say this, or at least he should come to the church that you pastor. Why? It's his church. He wants to come and see what's going on in that church. You hear from him what needs to happen in that church, and then you do what he told you to do with his church. It's very simple. I remember one time I was here, I was listening to a panel discussion uh, for a group of ministers. I was at a conference uh, of an organization that my wife and I are a part of, and uh, on that panel was, uh, of course, uh, Pastor Happy Caldwell, and he was talking about the transition when God, the Lord dealt with him to transition over uh, in Agape Church, to transition over and to install uh, someone else as pastor. Now, he had pastored this church for over 30 years. His wife, uh, Miss Jeannie, and their son had founded that church and grew that church up into a, a international body, uh, just a powerful uh, powerhouse for the kingdom of God there in Little Rock. And uh, when the Lord began to deal with him to transition over to uh, place uh, one of his sons in the faith in that position, someone asked him, you know, how could you just... Uh, turn it over and transition and walk away from what you had given so much of your life to. And he made a statement that I don't believe I'll ever forget. He said, it's easy when you realize it's his church. It's Jesus' church. See, that takes the pressure of making that church a success off of your shoulders, and it places that responsibility of success on the founder of the church because you're just doing what he told you to do. See, that's why a lot of ministers lose the joy of pastoring because they're concerned about things that are not the issue. They're, they're, I, I hear so many people talking and, and using this term, is the church relevant? Here's the question. Has Jesus ever become irrelevant? Has the gospel ever become irrelevant? No. The answer is unequivocally no. You can focus so much of your time and your energy on trying to be relevant and trying to make sure that you are quote unquote connecting with uh the society that we live in, that you fail to connect with the founder of the church that you're pastoring. Jesus can show us and direct us and lead us, the Spirit of God within us, as to what we need to do to reach our communities, to uh, reach the generation that we're a part of and not lose the joy of what we're doing. And I will say something as a side note, you never reach a generation by conforming to the generation. The plan of the enemy and the, the plan of many people is always to put pressure on you to conform conform to what we're comfortable with, conform to what we uh, want. That will never produce joy. That will steal joy. A, a standard, a standard, if you want to be, uh, I heard Pastor Carl will say something. If you want to be successful, raise the standard. If you want to be happy, lower the standard. See, we're talking about maintaining the joy in pastoring, the joy of pastoring. Your standard is what God has told you to do, what Jesus has told you to do with his church. When, when, when you begin to lower the standard, and understand what I mean by lowering the standard, 
I'm not just talking about dress and I'm not just talking about lights and smoke and <clears throat> these different things that people get hung up on. Those are also the things that will rob your joy. They'll, they'll rob your joy. As a pastor, you have to be you. you. You cannot be anybody else. You have to be you. You're going to have influences in your life. You're going to have people that influence you. They influence the way you preach. They influence the way you teach. They influence the way you want to carry yourself. That is all right and true and biblical. The Bible says that we're to imitate those and to follow the faith of those that went ahead of us. That's right and it's true and it's biblical. But ultimately, you have to be you. God is going to use your personality. God is going to use your makeup to be the pastor that he wants you to be, all right? My, my, for instance, my style of ministry and my style of pastoring is, is when I'm teaching the Word of God, I use a lot of illustrations. It, it really produces a challenge for people that are, are uh, translating for me, interpreting for me uh, into another language because I like to use a lot of illustrations such as, you know, I'll say, if a person was going to do this, you know, and that's how the Holy Spirit uses me. That's how the Holy Spirit uses me to get thoughts across to people. All right. I, I can, that's how I've got to minister. That's, that's where the joy of pastoring comes from. All right. Because you've got to be you. You, you cannot change who you are because that's what the societal norms are dictating. Because once you begin to conform in one area, that conformity has to carry itself through into, other, into every other area. All right? I, I am not saying anybody's doing anything wrong or that, that any church or any pastor's wrong. I'm saying as You've got to do what God is telling you to do because you want to maintain the joy of pastoring. It is his church. Now, let me go back to my original point. So you can fixate on are we relevant enough and lose the joy of pastoring Jesus' church. Well, I want to make sure I'm relevant. I want to make sure I'm using the right words. And I want to make sure I'm this. And I want to make sure I'm that. Well, where then where do you stop with trying to be relevant? Relevant in what vein? What, what is relevant to you? Uh, the way you speak, the way you dress, whether or not you have a tattoo, whether or not you, you use edgy, salty language in the pulpit. I mean... At what point do we say, okay, I'm relevant enough? Amen. Hello? At what point do we say I'm relevant enough and just get back to the joy of pastoring? Now, I, there are arguments that people will make, well, you know, but... Uh, you know, you, you, people want to be comfortable in church and, and you don't want to make people feel uncomfortable by the way you dress. And, and, you know, people don't necessarily like to dress up and the millennials don't like to dress up and you'll make them feel uncomfortable. And they, you know, listen, perhaps saying I will make them feel uncomfortable, maybe, maybe, maybe they're not feeling uncomfortable as much as they are as realizing they could do better than what they're doing. Maybe that's the challenge. But you can get so focused on it. I mean, you know, am, am I relevant if I, if I wear a, a suit without a tie? Is that relevant enough? Or, or, or how about a, a, a pair of jeans and a sport coat? without a tie, is that relevant enough? Or maybe jeans and a V-neck t-shirt, is, is that relevant enough? Where, where do I stop with the relevance 
And I'm just using this as an illustration as to what will rob your joy. I, where, where, do, where do I stop? Relevant to who? Am I only trying to be relevant to uh, the millennials? What, what about the elders? What about the people that are 45, 50, 55, 60, 65, 70? What, what do I do about that? Am, am I, do I not want to be relevant to them? You know, it's, it's not either or. The church is not a young vehicle. It's not an old vehicle. Every generation has to understand, every generation, the generation, not the generation in the past, that generation that very many, a lot of people call the generation in the past, is still alive and kicking. Those people are still coming to church. They still need the Word of God. Yes, there's a, new, there's a generation of young people that need to be reached, but there's a generation of older people that need to be fed and need to have the Word of God given to them as well. So where do we say, okay, I'm relevant enough? Relevant for who? Now, the older generation needs to get their nose out of the air and think that they're the best generation that's ever been. And the younger generation needs to get their nose out of the air and admit that the people that have went before them know something. You, do you see what I'm saying? And as a pastor, you're navigating those waters without coming under the pressure of am I relevant enough and lose the joy of pastoring. Because there are no throwaway people. You can't just do away with the elders and you can't just do away with the, the younger generation. You have to reach them all. But understand, my pastor brother, my pastor sister, that it is not how you dress that's going to reach people. That's not in the Bible. It's not in the Bible. The Bible says it is the gospel that is the power of God unto salvation. Now, there may be people that come to your church because it's quote unquote relevant. They may come to your church because they feel comfortable because, you know, our pastor uh, just wears jeans and a, and a t-shirt and, you know, he has a tattoo and, and he speaks the relevant language. They, they may feel comfortable with that. And you, you may get some people that are, that are comfortable but, but here's, here's the thing. It's the gospel. That's the power of God and salvation. And how you maintain your joy in pastoring is not leaving the pulpit wondering if you're relevant enough. It's knowing that you heard from Jesus about what to preach to his church and you ministered that word that day, that morning, that night. And when you go home, you go home satisfied, completed, and fulfilled because you did what Jesus wanted you to do. Don't get hung up on relevant. Don't get hung up on are we doing this enough? Are, 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 we, are, we, you know, are we edgy enough? That will cause you to lose the joy of pastoring. You do what Jesus said to you. Amen. Number two. Number one is it is Jesus' church. Number two is it they are Jesus' sheep. The people in your congregation are Jesus' sheep. John chapter 10, verse 27, Jesus said, My sheep know my voice. In that same chapter, he said that he was the good shepherd. They are Jesus' sheep. I'm responsible for caring for his sheep. And it is a joy to be his under-shepherd. But ultimately, in the finality, they are his sheep. My job is to be the under shepherd of the chief shepherd. Now, I, I go back and I reference what Pastor Caldwell said. He said, it's easy to do what Jesus asked me when I realize it's his church. They're his sheep. They belong to him. I'm keeping my father's sheep. 
See, you, you, we're going to touch on this some in our next point, but here's what you focus on. God has called me and chosen me and considered me faithful to care for his sheep. Woo, glory. That brings joy to me because he's called me and considered me faithful to care for his sheep, to care for his people, do you see? That helps me maintain the joy in my pastoring. You know, any time that things become a grind, you are, you are failing to focus on the right thing. I, I, I mean, there's challenges, and I understand that, and pastoring is work, but anytime it becomes a grind, there's a difference between commitment and grind. There's a difference between responsibility and drudgery. Anytime anything becomes a grind, you've lost the joy of it. And remember what we mean by grind, all right? Uh, in, a, in an engine, uh, a car engine, uh, the thing that stops the grind is the, the layer of oil between the piston and the wall of that engine. All right, there's an incredible amount of heat and incredible, excuse me, I don't like that word incredible. There's a, there's a tremendous amount of heat, a tremendous amount of friction within that engine. All right, so much so that if that oil, that thin layer of oil wasn't there, those parts would seize. All right, you've probably known people that, that have experienced that with their engine. But it becomes a grind. That engine is not supposed to grind. If you hear a grinding noise in your engine, you have a problem. <laughs> there, there, there is not a sufficient layer of lubricant oil in that engine to keep it running smoothly. Ministry is not supposed to be a grind. It's not supposed to, to grind and, and, and rub, all right? Now, how do I avoid that? Well, first of all, the people are Jesus' sheep. I'm doing this for Jesus. That produces joy. The joy of the Lord is my strength. Secondly, in this vein, understanding there's a flow of the Holy Spirit for pastoring my church. And the Holy Spirit is represented, represented by, in the Word of God, oil. It's represented by water, all right? So the oil, what does it do? It prevents the grind. The water, what does it do? It refreshes, it cools, it brings refreshing into my spirit as a pastor. I don't ever get overheated. I don't ever, when you start grinding and you feel that grind, you're just, uh, you're just uh, grinding. Listen, you need to go get alone with the Holy Spirit. Pray in the Holy Ghost. Ephesians chapter five, verse 18, be being filled with the Holy Spirit. How do I do that? Speaking to yourself in Psalms and hymns and spiritual songs. Amen. I refuse to struggle as a pastor. I'm not going to struggle with these issues. I'm going to maintain my joy. Don't grind. Don't grind. Don't, don't get into drudgery. Listen, I, I'm a runner. Love, really enjoy running. I've ran several marathons at this point, uh, eight marathons uh, at this point, a couple half marathons and and different things, but here's what I've learned over the years, and, and experts will tell you this, that any time running becomes a drudgery, you either need to, you need to do one of two things. Look at the route that you're running and change it, or take a break, do something else for a couple of weeks to maintain your health, and then go back to it. Here's why. If it becomes a drudgery, you won't keep doing it. If it becomes a grind, you won't keep doing it. You won't give it the attention that you should give it. You won't give it the, the uh, intensity that you should give it. All right? Pastoring is not supposed to be a grind. It's not supposed to be a drudgery. 
something that, that you just, oh my goodness, you know, I'm, I'm pastoring this church and I've heard pastors say these people are going to be the death of me. And, you know, you hear all these statistics about pastors and how, how much happier they were before they became pa- What? You were happier before you started doing what God called you to do? My friend, that makes no sense to me. That makes no sense to me. You should be at your happiest, your most joyful doing what God has called you to do. Amen. Let's move on. Hallelujah. Number three, number three, focus on the reward and the calling and not on the challenge. Focus on the reward and the calling and not on the challenge. I want you to look at something with me in 1 Peter chapter 5. This is one of my favorite chapters concerning pastors. And beginning in verse 1, he said, The elders that are among you I exhort, who am also an elder and a witness of the sufferings of Christ and a partaker of the glory that shall be revealed. Notice this. Feed the flock of God which is among you, taking the oversight thereof, not by constraint, but willingly, not for filthy lucre, but of a ready mind, neither as being lords over God's heritage, but be examples to the flock. And when the chief shepherd shall appear, you shall receive a crown of glory that fades not away. The Amplified Bible says the conqueror's crown of glory. Now notice this. What am I supposed to focus on? Well, I'm supposed to focus on the calling, I'm a pastor. Focus on what I'm called to do and the reward. Conqueror's crown of glory. I go through these verses and he says to be an example to the flock, not to lord over them, not to do anything with money as my motive, all right? To to function as an under-shepherd, to the chief shepherd. So when, when challenges arise, and they will, they will arise from time to time, what am I focused on? Praise God, I am called to do this. I am equipped to do this. I am able to do this. And the end result is I'm going to receive a conqueror's crown of glory that doesn't fade away. That is not a crown that's promised to everybody in the church. He is writing to pastors. That is a crown that's promised to the pastors. I call this the pastor's crown. You've got to focus on the calling and the reward and not the challenge. You focus on the calling and the reward. What does that do? It maintains the joy of pastoring. It maintains the joy of pastoring. All right? In uh, 2 Timothy chapter 4 and verse 2, you remember this very familiar passage of Scripture. The Apostle Paul told Timothy, he said, Preach the word. Be instant in season and out of season. Reprove, rebuke, exhort with all longsuffering and doctrine. Why? For the time will come when they will not endure sound teaching. But here's what I want you to see. What did he say to focus on? Primary focus, preach the word. That's the primary focus. That's the primary job of a pastor is to preach the word. Preach and teach the word. Don't get sidetracked on everything else. There are other things you've got to do. You've, You've got to maintain staff. You've got to lead the office. You've got to do these things. If you're building a building, you've got to be in charge of building and, 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 and overseeing that project and understand that. But the main job, preach the word. See, here's, here's your focus. Remember, we're focusing on the calling and the reward and not the challenge. In that same chapter, in 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 23, Paul said to Timothy, he said, but refuse these vain arguments, these these, uh, dumb questions that people want to get into. The Amplified Bible says, refuse, put 
shut your mind against things that foster strife and breed quarrels. Why? Takes the joy out of pastoring. Takes the joy out of pastoring. That Listen, there are answers you're not going to have as a pastor. You're, you're just, there, there are things. People that want to argue and want to uh, uh, come up with vain arguments, as the Bible says, you got to shut your mind. You got to refuse to think on that. Shut your mind against it and focus on what you're called to do. That will maintain the joy of pastoring. My primary job is feed the flock of God that is among you. That's the primary goal. When you start moving away from the, the primary reason for a thing, you're going to lose the joy of the thing. The primary reason that God has called you and placed you as a pastor is to preach and teach the Word. Hallelujah. When you get wrapped up in things, uh, discussions, arguments that do not matter, it takes the joy from pastoring. You've got to ask yourself, is that something I need to be involved in? Is that something I need to get into? Or is it going to take the joy out of your pastoring? You, you, there's just things you can't, you can't do. The Bible says that the man of God must not quarrel, but be peaceable, gentle to everybody. Now, that doesn't mean that there's not things you have to challenge and, and things that you have to correct and deal with, but what it means is this is you keep your focus. God did not call me to debate the word with people. God has not called any pastor to debate the word. I remember one time here in the city that we live in and that, that we pastor here in Kansas, the Kansas location. I remember one time there was a, a, a pastor that held a debate and was debating uh, with uh, an atheist. You know, they, 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 they were holding this debate in the city. And from what I remember, uh, it didn't draw very many people. And I remember seeing the flyer thinking, you know, why are you doing this? That's not what you're called to do. You're called to, to pastor the flock of God that is among you. Now, people will bring up and they'll say things, you know, well, you know, Paul debated and he talked with them at Mars Hill. and he. But Paul was not functioning in the office of a pastor. Paul was functioning in the office of an apostle that was there in that city for the purpose of ministering to that city in the role and in the calling that he was in. There were times Paul planted churches and he taught and he, he ministered and he would teach and preach in that church. And then there were times that he would go into cities as he did in Mars Hill and spread the gospel and people would begin to contend with him and, and uh, argue with him and he would answer their arguments and he would refute what they were saying with what the Word of God says. But that's not the pastor's job. Your, your job is to not get involved with every cause that comes down the road. You get involved with what God tells you to do. If, if, if God tells you to stand against certain things, then you stand against it. But don't get involved in all of these things that, that really don't matter because it takes the joy out of your pastoring. Hallelujah. Now, in Acts chapter 20 and verse 24, Paul said that what he wanted to do was finish his course with joy. Notice what it wasn't. It wasn't, I want to receive joy when I finish. It was finish with joy. Finish with joy. I want to finish my course. When I come to the point of finishing, I want to have joy. I want to finish my course with joy. There should be joy in your course and in your ministry. 
joy in your course and in your ministry. The course is what God has called me to do. The ministry is what I'm doing in that course. There should be joy in that. Hebrews chapter 13 and verse 17. The, the uh, uh, writer of Hebrews said this. He, he was talking to the people there in that church and he said to obey them that had the rule over you. Submit to them as those that are watching over your soul and must give an account to God. And he said submit to them so that they can do it with joy. All right. Because he said, without joy, without them doing it with joy, it, it will not be profitable to you. So when I lose the joy of pastoring, I become unprofitable to the people. I become unprofitable to the people. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Now, let me start wrapping this up. Number four. Do not allow a sense of familiarity to develop with people. Now, here's why. You cannot be everybody's buddy. You shouldn't try to be everybody's buddy. Now, I know there's always an argument, you know, well, but you know, pastors should smell like sheep and, and, and all of these things. Yes, pastors are with sheep and, and, and I guess if you want to use that terminology, pastors should smell like sheep. But here's the thing. You do not have to become familiar with people to effectively pastor them. You don't have to become familiar to effectively pastor people. Because you're not hiding anything. You are, you are maintaining the ability to most effectively minister to the people when you avoid becoming familiar. Anything you become familiar with, you tend to stop respecting. It's not that you're living wrong. It's not that you've got anything to hide from the people. It's that you want to be able to most effectively minister to them. And when you maintain that buffer between you and the people, not a separation, you're touchable, you're reachable, but when you maintain a buffer, and that word buffer is any device, any material, any apparatus used as a shield, a buffer, all right? It stops things from, from crashing together. In, when you maintain that buffer, all right, it, 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 it enables you to most effectively minister to the people. And the, the issue with this is the, the zone of non-familiarity that you maintain serves as a cushion between you and the people. And it will help you maintain the joy of pastoring. Touchable and familiar are two very different things. I'm very touchable by the people in my church. If after every service, I speak to many people, I shake hands, I visit, I hold babies. But at the same time, they know I'm their pastor. I'm very touchable. I'm very reachable. They can, they can uh, set up an appointment with me if they need to. But at the same time, we are not familiar. We're not familiar. All right? Touchable and reachable are two very different things than being familiar. Amen. Now, we're going to close here today, and we'll continue this with our next broadcast, our next uh, Pastor Essentials that we have. I want to pray for you. I really feel the Holy Spirit telling me to pray some things over you and to speak into your life. Because right now, some of you watching, you are at the, the crux. You are at a crossroads, if you will. And there are even people watching me that the enemy is doing everything he can do to put enough pressure on you to get you to quit. You've got to maintain your joy. You've got to maintain your joy. And what I'm sharing with you today is going to enable you to do that. Father, I pray in the name of Jesus for every man and woman watching today that, Lord, even those that feel they're at a crossroads and the enemy has put pressure on them to try to make them back away from what you've called them to do. Father, I pray that the joy of the Lord 
would flow into their spirit right now. Flow into their spirit. Strengthen them. Empower them. Enlighten them to do what you've called them to do. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Now, next month, we will continue with part two of the joy of pastoring. And it's such a pleasure to to come into your home, to come into your office, wherever you're watching this. And we so appreciate the kind remarks that you give us concerning Pastoring Essentials. And we're honored that you would listen to what we have to say. And we're so grateful for you as men and women of God. Well, listen, until we see you next time, I want to remind you to keep the switch of faith turned on and build your faith and frame your world by the Word of God. God bless you.